Well, it's good to see you. Good to have you all here. If you are visiting, we are so glad, so glad to have you with us. If you're passing through, thank you for taking the time to stop and be with us this morning. If you are looking for a church home, you're new to the area, or, or find yourself in search of a place where you can be with people who love God and revere His Word and simply want to be Christians in a really complex world, we hope you'll give us time to talk to you. That's what we, that's what we like to believe ourselves to be. We're just simply trying to be Christians, follow the Bible as best we can. And we are so glad to have you here. If you see things going on that that you're curious as to why we do what we do, let us know. Give us a chance to talk with you and share with you. Give us a chance just to get to know your name, too. I I have to tell you, in in church, uh, Paige and I said this when when we visited here for the first time a little over, I guess, going on four and a half years ago. We spent just a handful of hours with you all that day and walked away feeling like we'd known you for about 10 years. And I have had more and more people who will walk through this door and come up and I will get word later on and say, you know, I've been to a lot of really friendly congregations, but this one is right up there at the top of friendly congregations. You know how to make a visitor welcome. And I commend you for that, church. And uh, and so if you're visiting with us, let, let us have an opportunity to show you that friendliness. Uh, we, we want to be able to spend that time with you. I, uh, I'm curious. Does the name Dr. Walter Michelle mean anything to anybody? And see, you don't care about what name I just said. A lot of these kids are sitting there going, he just pulled out a bag of marshmallows. <laughs> Dr. Walter uh, Michelle, about 50 years ago, became famous for a study that he did with five-year-olds. That became, that this little study, I'm sure he probably had some really fancy, long name for it, but by and large, it was, it's become known as the marshmallow test. And he took five-year-olds and he put them into a room all by their lonesome, and he set a marshmallow on a plate. And he said, I'm going to give you a choice. You can choose to eat this marshmallow right now, or you can choose to wait. And if you can wait 15 minutes without eating the marshmallow that is on the plate right now, at the end of that time, I'll give you two. And then he put all these kids, all these kids, one at a time, they came in and they went through this test. Some of them were able to to withstand the urge and some of them held off eating that marshmallow and some of them just couldn't take it. They had had to eat it. And they would gobble that thing down after just a handful of minutes. And years later, the New York Times would, uh, would, would write about this, uh, about this test. It said, famously... Preschoolers who waited longest for the marshmallow went on to have higher SAT scores than the ones who couldn't wait. In later years, they were thinner, earned more more advanced degrees, used less cocaine, and coped better with stress. And as these first marshmallow kids now enter their 50s, Dr. Michelle and his colleagues are investigating whether the good delayers are richer too. Phil, congratulations, by the way. They've been sitting up here, and I'm impressed at the fact that you didn't grab one on the way down. So you you showed, you showed what a lot of these kids demonstrated that day. This has been a test that has been gone. It is is the go-to reference now for, for the idea that we human beings have the capability of demonstrating and exercising delayed gratification. Or another term that could go along with that, that could be used instead of delayed gratification. We might say that we have the capability of demonstrating and exercising self-control. Now, as we continue our study in leaf swatters or root choppers, would you like to take a guess at what our next quality of strong personal character is that Peter uses, speaks of in 1 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Well, you probably don't have to guess real hard. It is self-control. I like what David Mathis had to say about this. He said, self-control, it's not a flashy concept. 
or an especially attractive idea. It doesn't turn heads or grab headlines. It can be as, as seemingly small as it can be as seemingly small as saying no to another Oreo or French fry or milkshake or marshmallow or saying no to another half hour of, of Netflix or Facebook or self-control can feel as significant as living out a resounding yes to sobriety and sexual purity. Personally, I, I think you could make an argument that self-control is the most important quality that we could possess or develop in order to have a strong personal character. If nothing else, I, 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 want to, I, I would suggest to you that self-control is, is perhaps, a, a, it is at the very least a common sense characteristic of good, strong personal character. And the idea of controlling oneself presumes at least two things. Number one, it presumes that if we can speak of self-control, then it means that there is something within us that needs to be bridled. And if there is something that needs to be bridled, but we can still think about and exercise self-control, then it also it also speaks to the idea that there is the possibility within us or through us to draw upon some source of power in order to restrain that thing within us that must be contained. I, I, I could have waited on the marshmallows. I, I, I really could have. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big marshmallow fan. You could plop me down to a plate of those and I wouldn't touch them for 15, 30 minutes. Wouldn't bother me at all. Now you put a slice of pecan pie on that plate, or a slice of cheesecake, well, then we got a different story. We got problems at that point for me because I, well, I just love those. And, you know, come to think of it, I struggle with self-control <laughs> with anything sweet lying around the house, maybe except marshmallows. You give me a bag of cookies, I'm going to have one along the way. And I have a feeling there's a few of you out here that are just like me in that regard. You have sweets lying around the house. You're going to have a hard time expressing that self-control and exercising that to not eat those sweet things. But you know, truth be told, when it comes to self-control, there, there are a lot of things that I struggle with. A lot of things that I struggle with reining myself in on. Sometimes I... Sometimes I struggle in keeping my mouth shut when I need to keep my mouth shut. Sometimes I, I struggle controlling my temper and keeping it in check. Sometimes I, sometimes I have difficulty disciplining myself in how, I, in how I spend my money or making the best use of my time. I struggle sometimes with... with allowing that, that not-so-wholesome and not-so-holy entertainment come into my mind and into my heart. And I suspect that I'm not alone on that either. We all struggle. We all struggle with, with that fleshly thing that the Bible calls our self, that carnal part of us that that wants nothing more than to do, than to just simply do what feels right in the moment. If it, if it feels good to me right now, I want to do it. And I want to, I want to satisfy that craving. I want to, I want to satisfy my self. And you know, sometimes that's really hard. When we're, when we're in the moment, when we're battling through that, it's really hard, if not impossible, to articulate what that feels like. We know what it feels like, and, but, it's, but if you were to ask me to describe it, it's really hard to put that into words. What, well, I suppose Paul probably does it best. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, he said, For I don't understand my own actions, because I do not do the things that I want to do, and the things that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. I also think that this idea of self-control, I think this is what Jesus was talking about in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, when He said, If anyone would come after Me, let him deny 
himself daily and take up his cross and follow me. You see, with Jesus giving us that insight, with Jesus telling us that if we really want to follow Him, if we really want to be His disciple, then we have to be able to deny the self. He demonstrates or explains to us that self-control is essential. It is so central to living out the Christian life. It is such a pivotal part of strong personal character. For instance, as you read through the Scriptures, you will find that self-control is a major summary term for Christian conduct that is living out in full bloom. In Titus chapter 2, verse 6, he, Paul was encouraging Titus to teach the young men to be self-controlled in their Christian life. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Peter will make the statement, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. As we go through the Scriptures and as we look for for church leadership, you'll notice that self-control is one of the primary characteristics that is spoken of of uh, of leaders within the church. And then in Acts chapter 24, verse 25, as Paul is standing before Governor Felix, giving his defense of the gospel and of his ministry, Paul explains, he gives this, this summation of the gospel and the Christian worldview as being righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. It is part of the Christian life. It is a central, essential part of the Christian life. And you know, the thing is, we, we've seen what happens. We've all, we all know what happens and what it looks like when a person loses their sense of self-control for too long. For instance, in, in Proverbs chapter, that's actually supposed to be 23, Proverbs 23, uh, 29, he says, Woe, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of the eyes? I'll tell you who has all of these things. The wise men will go on. Those who tarry long over wine. Those who tarry over... Those who who go to try mixed wine. So so what he's indicating is those who lose control, their sense of self-control of those intoxicating substances that that they allow into their body. It makes for a life and it makes for a presence that is not exactly flattering. He'll also tell us, in, he'll also tell us in, uh, in Proverbs 15, verse 18, that a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. You ever seen somebody lose control of their anger and see the results of that afterward? The wise man probably summed it up best. He summed it up really well in Proverbs 25, verse 28, that a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. When you lose your sense of self-control, your defense is gone. Your ability to withstand the temptations that are coming your way is going to go along with it. You are like a city without walls for protection. But we also know what it looks like, by and large, when a person has self-control. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 5, 3 through 5, will give this description of what self-control looks like. He says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32, a longer section, but he's describing the new life. What it looks like when we have been called out of of our sinful past into the new creation, the new life of being in Christ. And he will describe that life as one that speaks truth as one that deals with anger quickly and doesn't let it sit overnight and give the devil an opportunity to get a foothold. He speaks of the new life as as being one in which we labor with our hands honestly and the thief no longer steals. 
He speaks of using wholesome speech that encourages people instead of tearing them down. And he speaks of this new life as being one of getting rid of bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor. What do you have to have in order for all of that to happen? You have to have self-control. And the person who has self-control, these are the things that we see them doing. These are the things that characterize their interactions with other people. Thankfully, God knew that we would need help figuring out how to go about pursuing self-control. God made us. He gave us that, that free will. He knows what He created within us. And so He knew that we would need help figuring out how to chase it down. And so He has given us insight into how we can achieve self-control as Christians. And so this morning, in the time we've got left, I want to give you real quick two, two insights from the Scriptures about how we can go about obtaining and exercising self-control as part of our strong faith-based personal character. And the first thing that we want to understand is that self-control must be taken with fierceness, not timidity. In his article, The Battle Against One More, Ed Welch made the observation, as the Hebrews were promised the, the land of Canaan, but had to take it by force one town at a time, so we are promised the gift of self-control. Yet we must also take it by force. The very concept of self-control betrays the fact that there is an ongoing battle of wills within us. The Corey over here that, that wants to just gratify the fleshly craving of the moment, but there's the Corey over here that, that I know deep down I don't need to do that, or this is a better option, this is healthier for me, this is a wiser option, and yet I battle this desire versus this desire. But Jesus makes the statement in Luke 13, 24 that shows us that this is not a battle for the faint-hearted. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And you say, well, Corey, that doesn't sound like a very, like a very uh, a strong, difficult statement. We strive to walk through the narrow door of, of faith. Well, here's the thing, though. That word strive that Jesus uses here in Luke chapter 13, it is the word agonizomai the Greek word from which we get our English term, agonize. Agonize to enter after, to enter the narrow door. The word agonizomai means to be a combatant in the public games, to contend, to fight, to strive earnestly. It's not just a, it's not just a casual I, I think I want to get this done type mentality. It is buckling down. It is being strong and coming at this with a veracity as if you were fighting for your life. And He'll give us an idea in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 of what this, this fierceness looks like. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. Now, is Jesus saying that we need to start mutil mutilating our bodies? I don't, think that, I don't think He means that literally. But He's telling us that we have got to do whatever is necessary in order to exercise self-control in our lives. People who are self-controlled get things done. Self-controlled people do not need someone looking over their shoulder constantly, driving them along to do what they already know must be done. Self-controlled people will do whatever it takes to keep from falling prey to those desires. It seems to me, church, and I'm just going to lay this out here. I'm going to be a little bit blunt about it, I guess. It seems to me that that the church has lost an awful lot of the toughness and tenacity that Jesus wants us to have. 
We've lost the willingness as individuals and as families and maybe sometimes as congregations to do what must be done in order to bring ourselves under control, in order to take control of our minds and our bodies to be what God is calling us to be. I think we've lost that. Because church, let's be honest, it's hard to say no. It's hard to say no to something when you want it so badly right there in the moment. You might even go so far as to say it is unnatural to say no. Because our, because our instinct is to just satisfy whatever I'm feeling that I want at the moment. But self-control is purposeful. It's deliberate. And it must be achieved one decision at a time. But here's the other thing about it, church. Self-control is not something where, where we, we just say no by our own sheer willpower. In the conversation of self-control, we must distinguish between worldly and godly self-control. The difference between the two is crucial because it determines who will get the glory for the victory when it's all said and done. Worldly self-control is sourced from within ourselves. It's just, it's me pulling myself up by my bootstraps, saying no, and then when it's all done, I pat myself on the back, maybe break my arm in the process if I feel that good about myself. However, if the power to restrain our desires comes from another source, then the glory for that victory doesn't go to me, it goes to wherever the source of the power is. Which is why the Bible will also tell us that self-control is gifted to us through the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, he speaks of self-control as being one of those fruits of the Spirit. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul will make the statement, Paul will make the statement, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Yet being a gift from God does not make this character trait any less ruthless and it makes it no less painful to achieve and exercise in our lives. Paul will go on in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, For this I toil, struggling with all of His energy that He powerfully works within me. That word struggling right there is the same word Jesus used for striving for the narrow gate. That agonizing. Paul says, I agonize with all of God's energy that He's working within me. In Romans chapter 8, verse 13, Paul will just say that if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. And this even goes back to our Old Testament times. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6, God made the statement, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The author John Piper, I think, summed this up really well. He said, godly self-control says no by faith. It says no by faith in the superior power and pleasure of Christ. Well, how does the Spirit produce this within me then? How does God's Spirit produce in me a character trait of saying no to myself? Well, this comes to our Scripture reading this morning. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Quoting again from John Piper, he said, When we really see and believe what God is for us by grace through Jesus Christ, then the power of wrong desires is broken. Therefore, the fight for self-control is a fight of faith. God's grace is teaching us day in and day out to deny the fleshly desires of the body. It is, it is teaching us to, to renounce those ungodly worldly ways and to focus our attention on the things that are above. 
Indeed, the fight for self-control is a fight of faith. And this is not an insignificant distinction. We need to understand that self-control is a product of God's grace working in our lives. And, it's, and when we realize the source of our self-control, the source of our ability to refrain from, to refrain from going after those fleshly pursuits, then it determines who gets the glory. God will receive the glory for the times that we are able to say no to those worldly things. Because true self-control is not about bringing ourselves under our own control, but under the power of Christ. And if we exercise self-control by faith in Christ's superior power and pleasure, He will get the glory because He deserves the glory. So here's what I want you to do as we, figure, as we wrap this thing up today. This week, I, I, we've already said it. I think we all have something in our lives that we need more self-control over. I guarantee it's the way it is because we're all flesh and blood. Here's my challenge to you this week. I want you to go home this afternoon and I want you to pick one or two things that you can figure out in your life that you need to be exercising more self-control over. I want you to make a game plan for how you're going to work on that. What, are, what decisions are you going to make? What pieces are you going to put in place that are going to help you exercise self-control? And if that means that you have to call somebody to be an accountability partner, you call somebody to be an accountability partner. Put a plan in place. Then I want you to hit your knees and I want you to pray every single day for the divine power from God to be able to say no to those things. Or if it's something where you need to have the self-control to start saying yes to something, then you pray for that, that God will give you what you need in order to restrain yourself in that area. And I want you to execute that just for one week. I want you to focus nonstop on this for one week and I want you to see what happens in your life. In order to be people of character, we must learn self-control. Root chopping, character, cannot be built without it. If you cannot restrain your passions, you will constantly be at the mercy of whatever breeze blows your way or whatever whim crosses your mind. And you will be left, as the wise man said, like a city broken into and left without walls. And so this morning, if we can help you, if we can help pray for that self-control, pray for that guidance from God, let us help you with that. If you need to take the first step of self-control by letting Jesus become the one that controls your life, by obeying the gospel, we want to help you there. And so if you need to become a Christian or if you need prayers for strength, forgiveness, let us know. This is an opportunity for you to make your life right with God in a public fashion if that needs to happen right now while we stand and sing.